morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, I want to welcome you. My name is Andy. If we know each other, then that's great. Uh, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, if we do know each other, well, if we don't know each other, let's fix that. Let me know. I'd love to meet you. If we know each other, you know I have a struggle of not talking faster than your ears can process. That's a struggle of mine. Uh, warning to you, my, my understanding is it's a little worse today than normal. So just want to let you know about that. If you have a seat belt there in your seat, put that on because I'm a little, uh, a little fired up about that. We're excited about this series that we're jumping into. We've been w- waiting for weeks to get to this series. It starts here, and it starts, this series starts today, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, not just the series, I'm excited about really this whole month. Uh, this whole month, we have this series that's, gonna, I think, going to be impactful for some people. We've got Easter coming up, which is very exciting in the life of the church. We get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. At the end of the month, in April, we're going to have a, a baptism Sunday where we think lots of people are going to pledge themselves to God. It's just going to be a great, a great deal. And this series in particular, we're starting that today. It starts here. This series is designed to help us understand the ways of God through Jesus Christ and, and how he challenged us when he was here to live a way that's very different than the world, very different than what my natural inclination would be. And so week after week, we're going to hit these attributes of Christ, these teachings of Jesus, and how they're so different than what I want to live in. And it's going to be challenging, I think, for all of us. So today we're looking at the topic of redemption. To help us with that, would you grab your Bible? I'll show you one there in front of you and turn to Matthew chapter 9. It's page 680, Matthew chapter 9. We'll be there in just a minute uh, together. So if you want to go ahead and turn to that, that would be awesome. So today's topic is redemption. Uh, Americans love a good redemption story. You give Chip and Joanna Gaines some old shiplap siding and some barn wood, and you got yourself a TV show. I mean, that's all it takes, really, is that, that deal. We love seeing that old stuff turn into new stuff and all of that. We love shows as a culture where people go into their garage and find old junk and then sell it for lots of money. That's always very cool to us. I saw this picture here, this drum. Uh, This guy found it in his attic. He brought it to one of these shows. They said it's worth $15,000. Now, I don't know if it's worth $15,000 or not. My dad always said something's worth what somebody's going to pay for it. I can't imagine somebody pulling out a checkbook for fifteen k. Anybody want that drum for $15,000? I'll sell it to you today. Give the fifteen dollars to me, and I'll make sure you get it. I mean, I'm not sure, but it makes good TV because we love that redemption story. This old piece of junk has made something valuable. Even our health. Every year, Americans cheer on people whose health's gotten out of control, and they lose a bunch of weight and get back on track, and we celebrate it. We sit on our couches with a big bowl of ice cream. We watch it week after week, and we say, go for it, you guys. That's awesome. We eat our ice cream with chocolate on top. It's fantastic. We love a story when somebody takes something that's gone wrong, broken, and they've, they've turned it around again. And almost always, if not always, it requires somebody else from the outside to insert themselves into their story. So somebody else said, hey, that drum's worth something. Or somebody else said, hey, that barnwood could be something. Or somebody else said, I can work with you and make, make this health thing go a different direction. You know, redemption says, redemption means to compensate for the faults or the, or the failures of someone or something. And we love it when that happens. When someone sacrifices on themselves to help someone else fill in those gaps. And Jesus did that so masterfully when he was here. But it's not always been that way. The way of Jesus is not always the way the world has ran. Our world historically focuses on failure and weakness, retribution and judgment. We still do that today. And when Jesus walked the earth, many of today's worldviews were alive and well then. Things that that were true of them, they're still true today. Like the Hindu model of the caste system, where if you're stuck in a certain socioeconomic standard, you'll never get better than that. That's just where you're stuck at forever. Or the Buddhist model of karma, where people get what they deserve. Or the Jewish model that says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Whatever they did to you, do it back to them in spades. Even today, the American model says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You've heard that, right? We've all been steeped in that mindset. And that makes a lot of sense to us in a lot of ways. But Jesus' model was so different. Jesus said, love your enemies. Jesus said, do unto others as they've already done to you. Oh, wait, he didn't say that. That's, I, I made that up. That's not true. He said, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Very different. The golden rule still stands today in secular and religious culture as a model of how to do life among people. We also have other statements from Jesus that we still celebrate outside of the church, like turn the other cheek or go the extra mile. Jesus' words change culture forever. Revelation 21.5, Jesus said, I'm making everything new. And one day, he's going to complete his work of redeeming this entire world, this entire planet, and we're going to all feel that difference. 
Jesus taught redemption because God believes in redemption. And when you and I fight for redemption, when you make it a life goal of yours, when I make it a life goal of mine to find things that are broken, that are irredeemable on their own, and we help them find the love and grace of God through Christ so their life becomes a different thing. When we fight for redemption, when we fight for the broken, when we fight for the sinner, when we fight for the failure, we're aligning ourselves with the heart of God because he did that through his son Jesus. Because God believes in redemption. And it's not easy. It's not easy because inside of us is a war. You know, on the one hand, we say, yeah, I love redemption. I love some you know, shiplap siding going on, making that all new. That's all great. That old becoming new. That's fantastic. I want to see the best in people. I want us to have love and mercy and grace. I want to have kindness towards those who are a mess. I love that. But on the same hand, we have a, a natural inclination towards justice. And that's good, too. To say people should get what they deserve, and we should stand up for our rights, and we should make the standards that God sets out be upheld. And we have that right inside of us too. So we have both of these, and there's a war inside of us, a tension that says, I want both. I want to see the best in people, but I want to stand up for righteousness, and I want to be kind, but I also want to be true. And how do you do both of those? Jesus modeled that so Beautifully. If you have your Bible there in Matthew chapter 9, uh, verse 9 is where we're going to start, page 680. It's just a day in the life of Jesus. Verse 9 says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now the setting is so critical. Jesus called Matthew as he was sitting at the tax collector's booth, as he was collecting taxes. This wasn't Matthew, the former tax collector, Matthew who used to do that back in the day. Matthew is currently sitting at the tax collector's booth collecting taxes. Now, if you're not a Christian person, the first century tax collector may not mean anything, but you still hate taxes, right? I mean, it's just this time of year, and so everybody hates taxes. That's, that's true of everybody. And so tax collectors aren't very popular even now, but they were less so then because in that day, there was lots of fraud. No fraud in our day, but in that day, lots of fraud, and even more than we have today. And so tax collectors would say, this is what Rome requires. If I can manipulate people, especially those who are poor and don't have a lot of support and legal advice and knowledge, if I can manipulate them into giving this much, then I can take that much and stick it in my pocket, and I can turn this to Rome, and I can get rich. And tax collectors were notorious for being very wealthy, very greedy, and very hated. And Matthew was sitting at his booth doing his thing. When Jesus comes up and calls him in the middle of the corruption, in the middle of the embezzlement, in the middle of the greed, Jesus calls him to follow after him. Not just to be his follower, not just to be his disciple, but to be on his leadership core team. This is one of the 12 that Jesus called him into. I mean, he's a little sketchy spiritually. And yet you, you notice as you look at those that Jesus called, he fits right in. The, the 12 people Jesus called were a mess. On the night of his greatest need, when the soldiers were coming to arrest him, 11 of his disciples all ran. The only one who didn't run was Judas, who, was t- who turned him in. What a mess that group was. Think about the 11. Peter famously betrayed him multiple times in public. Simon was a zealot who wanted to strap on a sword and use violence to drive out the Romans. James and John were notoriously, famously angry people. When Jesus calls them in Mark chapter 3, he gave them a nickname. He said, you two boys are the sons of thunder because you just have this temper. You just have this, this, this aggression underneath you. And you see it later in Luke chapter 9 when there's a group that didn't, didn't welcome them, the disciples. And so they pulled Jesus off the side and said, do you want us to nuke them? We'll call fire from heaven. Let's have God just wipe them off the planet. Just nail them out. This is a sketchy bunch that Jesus had around him. And he called them not because they were perfect or because they were righteous, but because he had a heart for people. And he believed in redemption. So key we get this. Look at verse 10. So while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, now wait a minute, that's that's another step. He He called Matthew out and about. Then he goes to Matthew's house. And then many tax collectors and sinners, friends of Matthew's, came and ate with him and his disciples. We're going too far here. When the Pharisees, the pastor types, saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's a great question. Now, make sure, make sure you ask this question for yourself. The real temptation when you're reading through the Bible, if you're a Bible student, you've been doing this a while, is anything that comes from the Pharisees, you know, that's bad advice. Anything from Jesus is good advice. And you kind of shut your brain down on that. But just let yourself live in this moment. Jesus calls Matthew a hated tax collector and then goes and sits at his house 
while all the other tax collectors come over and they had this big party. You've got to resonate with the idea that they're going, now wait a minute, that's not right. And some part of us feels that way. Why is that? Why is he having di- dinner with all of Matthew's sketchy friends? Why is he eating with gre- greedy embezzlers? So verse 12 says, on hearing this, Jesus apologized and left at once. <laughs> oh, wait, he doesn't say that. I made that up. <laughs> he didn't say that at all. I made that up. Uh, it said, Jesus had ch- chosen to eat with the tax collectors instead of preach at the tax collectors. But now in verse 12, Jesus decides to start preaching. Not at them, but at pastor types like me. Verse 12 says, on hearing this, the question, why does he eat with sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus makes three statements back to back to back. Only a couple times in scripture he does this. And every time he's fighting for the sinner, he's fighting for the broken. Luke 15 is another great example. So three back to back statements of God's heart for people, even broken, messed up people. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Three times to drive his point home on where God's heart is for those who aren't there yet. Their life's not right yet. Jesus just lived this way. I said this a day in the life of Jesus. Look over the, the next page, verse 35. This is either later that day or maybe the next day. Verse 35 says, Jesus went out through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. He was in all the towns, all the villages, teaching in synagogues, proclaiming the good news about God, healing every disease, every sickness, and crowd after crowd after crowd after crowd. And we don't know how many people were there, but you need to get the mindset of this. You hear crowds, and maybe you think 20 people, maybe you think something different. Like, what does that mean? We don't know. The Bible didn't tell us. I, I, look, I look forward to getting to heaven and watching the video and seeing how big the crowd was. But until then, just, just take a moment and think about what would happen if, if that happened today. We live in a very affluent culture. Spring Hill is a pretty young community, so fairly healthy. We have lots of access to health care. But if Jesus hung out in the Walmart parking lot today and healed every disease and every sickness, what would the crowd look like? It'd probably be hard to drive down Main Street. It'd be it's so weird. It'd be hard to drive. That was a joke. You can laugh at it. I mean, it's... <laughs> It, it, can you imagine the crowd that'd be there? If Jesus was in the Walmart parking lot, it would be bedlam of people there to get every disease healed, every sickness cured. People would be driving hours away to get their long, you know, their grandma to bring her back, or Aunt Susie to bring her to have her healed, because Jesus is healing every disease and every sickness. So when it says crowds, you've got to translate that in your head of what the the size of this group would look like. So look at verse thirty six. Verse thirty six says, "When he saw the crowds." He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We saw the crowds, he had compassion. Compassion is the Greek word splagna. It literally means the inward parts. They translate it compassion because that's a great English translation. But it literally means your guts. Like Jesus felt it at a deep level. He was moved in his spirit for the crowds. He saw their pain. Now, Jesus had something that we don't have. Like, I, I'm standing before a pretty good-sized group here. I don't see all of your sin. I don't see it. If Jesus were standing right here, he would see every wrong thought, every wrong action, not just from today, but this week, this month. He would see all of it, all your past mistakes, your, your darkest moments. He would see all of it. And yet Jesus, looking at the crowd, thousands very likely of people, millions of sins, What he saw was compassion. He was moved in his gut. He saw their pain, their need, what life was like for them without God, and he was moved for it. That's the way Jesus often lived his life. He would preach, he would teach, but he often healed first. He would heal their body before he offered healing for their soul. He would feed their body before he offered to feed their soul. He met them where they were with compassion. So when people saw Matthew here in In Matthew chapter 9, they saw his greed. They saw how he took money from the poor. They may have had personal examples of Matthew treating them wrong. How he betrayed his own people. And Jesus saw every bit of that. He wasn't blind to it or naive. But he saw it all through the hope of redemption. He saw Matthew for not just what he was or what he has been, but what he could be. So he didn't criticize his accounting or his ethics, although that was probably worthy of that. He gave him an invitation. He invited him to join him. 
to spend time with him, to eat together. Jesus always saw people through the hope of redemption. When people saw the Samaritan woman, same deal. They saw her many failed marriages. They saw all of her sinful choices. They saw her shame. Jesus was aware of every bit of that, but that's not what he saw first. He saw her through the hope of redemption. He saw a woman who needed to be accepted and loved, and so he invited her into a life without condemnation. And here in Matthew 9, Jesus first saw that the crowds were harassed. His first expression wasn't their sinfulness or their brokenness or their their rebellion from God. His first response was, they're harassed. His second was, they were helpless. His third was like, they're sheep without a shepherd. And he longed to be their shepherd. He longed for them to allow God to do what God can only do in their life. He lived and moved and was loved that way because he believed in redemption. And that's what Wellspring has always been about. If you're new to Wellspring, you may not get the gist of who we are. Let me just give you just a snippet of who we are. We don't take ourselves too seriously. Not because what we're doing is not important. We think what we're doing is very, very important. So we take that real seriously. We don't take ourselves too seriously because we understand that nothing good in me comes from me. It's from God. And nothing good in you comes from you but from God. So we can have a lot of humility towards one another. A lot of humility when we disagree with each other. A lot of humility when we mess up or we don't do things the right way. But we take the standards of God very seriously. We take the mission of God very seriously. We just believe that anyone can be saved. No one is too far away. And we want to partner with people who have those same goals. As we laid this series out, one of the goals we had was to to highlight a different ministry every week so that you would be exposed to their ministry, but also so that so we could help them out and partner with them. So today, we want to tell you about a ministry called Scarlet Hope that believes in the hope of redemption. They started in Louisville, Kentucky, and now they're in four different cities. But 11 years ago when it started, Rachel Starr, the founder, had been sensing from God for over a year that she needed to do something for women in the adult entertainment industry. But she didn't want to, as many of you might suggest, I don't think I want to do that, God. That's not what I'm feeling led to do. But she, for a year, God was after her. So finally, 11 years ago, she walked into a strip club in Louisville for the first time. And she walked up to the lady behind the counter and she said, I feel like I'm here to show love to these ladies. And so she said, Jesus has sent me here to do something kind and loving for the women in this club. Can I bring in a meal? And the lady said, no, you're not here to work. You're not looking for a job. And you're not here to to look at these ladies, so no, we're not open to that. You need to leave. Well, she was praying about all that. She felt, you know, she felt like that's what she's supposed to do. And so she looks around the club and she sees a man over there, and she kind of felt led by God to go talk to him. So she went over and talked to this guy, said the same spiel. Jesus sent me to do something kind and loving for the women in this club. Can I bring in a home cooked meal? And he was the owner of the club, she found out later. He said, Sure, come on. And that Thursday night, And every Thursday night since then, in that club and multiple clubs in Louisville and now in Cincinnati and also Reno and Las Vegas, teams of volunteers bring in home-cooked meals on Thursday night because it's right before the weekend rush. Sometimes it's the first home-cooked meal these ladies have ever had. Other times it's the first one they've had in a long, long time. And, And they don't just drop the meal off and go. They sit down and eat together, and they don't rush. They talk, and they listen, and they love without any judgment or condemnation. Now, make no mistake, they, they want these women to make different choices. They want these ladies to get out of that lifestyle and into a different place. They want them to find redemption, but that's not the starting point of any relationship. That's not the starting point of trust. They're not, they, they're, that's not seeing people through the eyes that Jesus saw people through. So they start in a relational place. I want you to get a visual of who these folks are. So we have a video you can watch. Take a moment to watch this together. I was sold when I was 12 years old. Told I was cheap, hopeless. I felt like a child roaming the desert. Just a child, a toy for them.
as horrific a story that most of these women have experienced from a young age, there is so much joy seeing and participating in the redemption Christ has had for these wonderful, beautiful women. It's Scarlet Hope, you know, it's given me hope in so many ways. It's given my life structure, helped me to find out who I am, you know, and learn how to live and just be myself, just to hold myself accountable for things, that there's a better, better day tomorrow, a better day today. You know, every day that I do this program, I get happier, you know, and I learn more. For 10 years, we, Scarlet Hope, have followed this decisive call by God to plant a presence in the heart of where most people would never think to go. Because our Father is a giver, and though these women have experienced so much of the opposite, our mission is Christ's ultimate message, that though the lion has come to steal, take life, and destroy, Jesus came to give life. Our Father is a giver of life. And oh, have we seen life. I have a great support system now, emotionally and spiritually. I have more confidence more than ever and don't feel abandoned or alone. Everyone here is my family. They encourage me and I just got custody of my 16 month old. The Scarlet Hope program has impacted my life by showing me God's love is all the love that I need, and you can do all things with His strength. They show me that just because my past is dark, I can still build a bright future. Scarlet Hope has gave me hope in rebuilding my life. Scarlet Hope has helped me find my voice. Scarlet Hope has helped me move forward with my life. I came here broken. I now am mending. I came here hopeless, and I have hope. I came here not knowing how to love to become a loving person. I came here not knowing how to be a mother to turn into being a good mom. I've learned accountability. I've learned that I have a purpose. It's done so much remarkable things in my life. The only thing if I could give it, simply amazing. This group has a residential program. Our, some of our team has been there to see that, to give these ladies a safe place to stay because they don't often have that. They, they, they've begun a bakery to provide them job training and abilities to make money outside of the industry. They offer them discipleship and counseling and support, but mostly they offer them love and the hope of redemption because there's a different way to do it. You know, this group of people, society is often proclaimed, often without our words, that they're irredeemable, that they've gone too far. They're outside of the, the love and the scope of God's church. But we're declaring that's not true. Jesus declared that's not true. There's no one outside of the reach of God. There's no one who's gone too far or done too much. None of us inside this building and none of them outside of this building. Their residential program is 18 months long. It provides them housing and food and support and encouragement and counseling and training and job skills and all of that. It's an important but expensive uh, proposition. So we're making a donation as a church in your honor. $1,500 will provide one dear woman with one month in this important program. And we're honored to do that. To say that no one is too far. No one is too far. Back in Matthew 9, you got to catch this. This is the best part of the whole thing. Back in Matthew 9, it said Jesus saw the crowds. He had compassion on them. They were harassed and they were helpless. He saw their plight. He saw their pain. He was moved in his gut. Now, he's the son of God, so he's got, got a great answer to this problem. What's he going to do? Look at verse 36. 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So what's he going to do? Then he said to his disciples, At the harvest is plentiful. The need is great. But the workers are few, so ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus said to pray to God that he would send us, that we would have compassion, that we would be moved in our gut, our splagna, to be motivated to care 
and to love and to go. For God to fill us with the hope of redemption. That everyone we lock eyes with, every single person we lock eyes with, is redeemable by God, just as we're redeemable by God. And every single person we lock eyes with is worthy of the love of God, just like we are. This message, I, I tell you, I, I, I've toiled over this message for hours and hours and hours. Let me boil it down to some couple takeaways and then we'll be dismissed. First takeaway is we need to embrace the grace of God. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. That's his promise. It's the power of redemption that came at, at a, not a cheap cost. Jesus had to live and die and rise again to buy that our freedom. Romans 8 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God takes us by nothing that we've done or earned, but by us opening our life to him. He takes us and he, he puts us in this place called redeemed where God has forgiven us of our sin. God has given us a future in heaven, and God has begun to work through and redeem and have our salvation lived out into every corner of our life. We're restored with the living God, and God's grace allows us to trust Him, not just in that one decision, but in every decision as we live our life with Him. Chapter 3 says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. That promise of rebirth and renewal, redemption, is still available to every man and woman and child on this planet. And I'm convinced from this verse and others that the best way forward for you spiritually and for everyone we meet is not just by trying harder, that just leads to a lot of frustration, but trusting God more. And when you and I trust God more, it allows us to re- Him to do the work that He does inside of us to redeem our broken life and soul. And because I know that, we need to create an environment, a community here at Wellspring where anybody can come to, no matter what they've done, no matter what they're doing, knowing that God is the only hope that they have in their life. So we can see them and convey hope to them through our eyes and our voice and our hugs and our genuine care. Let's be a community where everyone can find God's grace because where would any of us be without it? We need to embrace the grace of God. We also need to embrace the truth of God. Romans 1 describes a culture turning away from God. You can read that later. It describes that they turned away from the knowledge of God and their lifestyle began to turn away from God. And as that happens today, as we see it in our culture today, As each one begins to do what's right in their own eyes, not what's right based on the knowledge of God, we're going to begin to see more and more chaos and pain. We're only beginning to see the the chaos that leads to. You see, redemption is not just acceptance. Redemption is not just kindness. There's more. You know, I saw saw a news story this week where somebody had found an old Monet uh, picture at a yard sale. I think it was Monet. And it's worth like $15 million. Anybody else see that story? This million, multi-million dollar painting they found just being thrown away. What would happen if you went, uh, John Burke asked the question, what would happen if you went to a, a yard sale and you see a picture frame that's interesting to you, kind of dirty, the, the painting itself is all covered with mud, but the picture frame looks interesting. You thought, I'll clean that up. I'll buy that for five bucks just to have the frame. And when you get home and you're beginning to clean the frame off, you see on the corner the, the lettering looks familiar and you realize that may be a Da Vinci underneath all that mud. Burke says you have three options. You can either throw it away because it's ruined, it's muddy, you can go to your garage and get a good wire brush and scrub that thing clean, but you'll ruin it. Or you can take it to the only person capable, a redemption specialist, an art specialist, who can redeem that muddy, ruined painting and put it back to what it was initially designed to be. And because of the great worth inherent in that painting, you would do the latter. It's the only thing that makes sense. And when we see muddy, broken, sinful people in our world, we can either toss them away because they've ruined their life, We can scrub them ourselves with a wire brush and ruin them in the process, or we can point them to Jesus, the one who redeemed our soul, and the only one qualified to redeem theirs. Only Jesus can redeem the corruption we find in our world. Only Jesus can lead us to life and peace. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, I love this verse, says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. If you want times of refreshing in your life, and some of you need that right now, Repent from your sin. We all have it. And turn to God so that times of refreshing will come from Him. And if you want your friends in your life, 
spiritual and non, to have times of refreshing, that's where it comes from. And ultimately, our job is to point them to Jesus who can help them repent of their sins and turn back to God so that times of refreshing will come from Him. And the best way forward, the best way to get there is when our kindness partners with the kindness of God. Because He used His kindness to lead us to repentance. And we join Him when we embrace the truth of God in a kind way. And third, we have to embrace messy. You know, we don't live in a in a time and an era when the majority of culture agrees with the majority of Scripture. We don't live in that time. We don't live in a time when the truth of God falls always on humble, repentant ears. That's not the world we live in right now. And in fact, it's even harder because we live in an age where, that God predicted would come where churches will form around false teaching. And they'll say things that aren't true. And it's going to be complicated. And people are going to be broken. And people are going to be hurting. And it's going to be messy. We need to embrace messy. It's the only way forward for us, friends. One of my favorite, probably all-time ten favorite books is by Philip Yancey called What's So Amazing About Grace. If you've not read it, put that on your list at some point. He talks about a a counselor friend of of his who had a young woman come in who was a prostitute, and she wanted counsel because she was all a mess. And through sobs and shrieks and tears, she tells him her story. She said that she'd been working as a prostitute for a long time. She had a, a little girl, and her drug habit has increased, and the pimp took more and more money. She didn't have enough money for her drug habit, so she realized she could rent out her two-year-old daughter and make more money in an hour from her daughter than she could all night by herself, so she just started doing both. And she hated doing it, and she hated herself for, for it, but she had this drug habit, and so what was she going to do? And Yancey's friend, the counselor, is just mortified by hearing the story. And he, he doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know what to do. And she tells more and more details. And finally, he says to her, have you ever considered going to a church for support? Some spiritual guidance and help. And he said, I'll never forget the look of naive, pure shock on her face. She said, church? Why would I ever go to the church? I already feel terrible about myself. They would just make me feel worse. And Yancey writes, what struck me is women like this in Jesus' day often fled toward Jesus, not away from him. The worse someone felt about themselves, the more likely they were to find Jesus as a refuge. Has the church lost that gift? And then Yancey writes these words, evidently the down and out who flocked to Jesus when he lived on earth no longer feel welcome among his followers. And friends, as people stray further and further from the truth of God, Their lives are going to unravel further and further from the design of God. And it's going to require that God's people speak messy more and more fluently. We're called to embrace grace fully and truth. Not a little of both. Fully graceful and fully truthful. Just as Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. You know, sometimes I hear people and they'll they'll say something like, I miss the good old days when it was simpler. When everybody followed God, and everybody loved God, and everybody spent time with God, and everybody walked with God, that was a great time. And I get that. I get that. I resonate with that struggle. I'm just not sure that time ever existed. The last time that the the world was like that was when a man and a woman walked with a garden with their creator. And then a snake came along and ruined everything. Snakes do that. It's right in the Bible. You can read it later. They'd ruin that every time. And from that time on, things have been messy. So now gardens have weeds, and childbirth has pain, and men have midlife crises. It's Genesis chapter 3. You can read all of that right there. It's messy. And until Jesus comes back to set things right, we're going to live in messy. And so our only option is to retreat away from that into little huddles where we can just focus on the ways of God and stay completely separate from messy, or we've got to learn to speak messy much more fluently. We have to embrace messy as the people of God. We've been working on this series for weeks and weeks, doing the graphics and the logos and all that stuff. But this week, they put up this little deal here, and I had nothing to do with it, so I could brag on it, right? So it looks great. And, and I never had no. I came in Thursday to see it, because I hadn't seen it up yet. And it just hit me. I'm alone in this room. No one else is here. It's just me and God, I guess. We're hanging out. And I see that the logo, and I hadn't seen it by itself like that, and it jumped out at me. I felt like God kind of whispered to me in that moment. Because when you see that that marker, you usually see it on Google Maps or Waze or whatever what it is, right? And it tells you one of two things. It either tells you where you are or it tells you where you're going. 
And so many in Spring Hill, many of you in this room, don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going. And we had the cross put in the middle of the logo. It's subtle, but it's on purpose because you're going to find where you are, your identity in Christ, and you won't find it in anything else. And you're going to find where you're going, your purpose in Christ, and nowhere else. And people in Spring Hill are searching for that. And some of them are searching for it in the middle of broken, messed up lives. And some of them are searching for it behind big houses, gaining the whole world and losing their soul. But they don't know where they are. They don't know their identity. And they don't know where they're going. They don't know their purpose. And you can find all of that in Christ. So if you don't know where you are, I want you to submit yourself to Christ today. Submit yourself to his leadership and his, le- his guidance and his teaching and his forgiveness. And let him redeem your soul. And you'll discover your identity, not in your job, not in your kids, not in your politics, not in your profession. You'll find your identity in Christ and only in Christ. And until you get that part settled, nothing else is going to fall in its rightful spot. And if you want to know where you're going, your purpose, you find that in Christ Because the moment you and I realize that our number one job, our primary job is not where you go on Monday. Your primary job is helping redeem the world and pointing them to the hope of redemption in Christ. Monday's just your destination. Your purpose is in redemption. And when you realize that God has not only forgiven you, if he has, he's forgiven you, but now he's asked you to join his team to redeem the world and make everything new. And the moment you realize that's my prime objective, everything else falls secondary. Your life will take on purpose and meaning it's never had before. And I want you to have that because so many in Spring Hill, many in this room, do not know where they are and they don't know where they're going and you'll only find that through God. Let's pray together. God, I ask that you would point us to your son, Jesus, and through your son, Jesus, we would all be very clear about who we are, where we are, or what our identity is, And where we're going. The purpose in this life. So many of us are busy chasing dreams and money and kids all around fields, all over this this county, trying to do everything the right way, and yet we feel empty inside. And our identity comes from you, not from any of that. And our purpose comes from you, not from any of that. As good as those things might be. So God, clarify for us who we are and why we're made. God, I pray that lots of people in this room would yield themselves fully right now to your redemptive purpose. For those who have never given their life to you, they would, they would submit themselves. and They would ask you to be their leader, their forgiver, to forgive them of their sins and to point them in the area of your newness. For those who have been following you, But as I have, sometimes find gaps, daylight between us, where my sin is separating us. Today we would come to you and we would offer ourselves fully and ask for your forgiveness. And God, I pray that today, every one of us, from those you're calling for the first time to those who have been walking with you for a long time, every one of us, like Matthew, would take our place on the team to redeem the world by your power and your strength through our eyes and our voice and our kindness and our mercy and our love for everyone we see and every place we go. Church, pray to God about those two invitations this morning and then I'll pray for us as well. God, we thank you for Jesus, our only hope. We pray to you now in his name. Amen.